to everyone and welcome to uh, the online participants in this uh, part of the continuing Institute for European Affairs series of webinars on the future of Europe. We're very pleased uh, to have as our speaker today, Konrad Szymanski, Minister for European Affairs in the government of Poland. The minister was appointed to his post in March this year. Prior to that, he has held office as Secretary of State for European Affairs and uh, prior to that was a member of the European Parliament for the Law and Justice Party for a 10-year period. He also worked in an earlier um, uh, incarnation as uh, an official in the Polish lower house, the, the CM. He therefore brings an exceptional amount of experience of European Union business both at government and parliament level. And it's an experience, of course, that he will need to draw on as the European Union tackles what the minister himself has described as the most difficult negotiations in the history of the EU in the recovery phase after the, uh, after the pandemic. Minister Szymanski's talk today is to cover political and social challenges for Europe after the COVID-19 crisis. The minister will speak for about 20 minutes or so and is then open to questions from participants. All of this is to be on the record. Uh, for questions, uh, participants can use the question and answer facility uh, on the Zoom interface in order to submit them. So welcome again, Minister Schumanski uh, to the IIEA. And may I welcome at the same time the participation of the Polish ambassador to Ireland, uh, Anna Sohanska. Minister Szymanski, we look forward to your address. Thank you, Peter, for uh, invitation uh, and, and very kind uh, introductory uh, note. Uh, it's a privilege to be here somehow in the um, Institute of International and European Affairs, spending some time before in previous, previous incarnations in think tank community in Warsaw. Uh, I'm quite familiar with your enormous uh, works uh, since 1990. Uh, so it's a, it's a great honor to be uh, online at least uh, uh, at your premises with your uh, audience in, in Dublin. Of course, it's a, it's a pity we can't be together in real terms. I hope it will be possible soon, but, but this way of uh, communication is, is of course equally important especially in this time, as you, as you mentioned, uh, complicated uh, and uh, quite important for the future of the Union. Every negotiation process is important for the future, that's, that's obvious, but I think our future as a Union isn't uh, granted uh, for, for sure, uh, for the first time in history probably, uh, and this is very, very important moment. Uh, we feel this responsibility for the future because I don't need to add that the future of the European integration, the future of Europe, is very important for Poland. Uh, not only in terms of uh, economic uh, development, uh, cooperation, trade integration, which is very, very valuable asset of the integration to, to, our, uh, to our welfare, but also in political terms, uh, European Union is a very important uh, pillar of the uh, unity of the West. And we pay enormous attention to this unity of the West uh, based on EU, NATO, other organizations, because uh, the world we live in isn't uh, that secure as we used to believe. Uh, we have a, a lot of competitors at least, uh, if not challengers uh, around us. So we have to be careful with our own future. And the future of the Union is very important for every European country, in, including uh, Poland. The post-COVID situation we we experiencing right now isn't the, the first uh, crisis we experienced last year. So we have a cumulative crisis situation in many different angles. First of all, of course, the debt crisis after 2008. You know it better than us, being part of the Eurozone and successfully going out of this, of this uh, crisis. Uh, and of course, migration crisis a couple of years later, not related in, in terms of substance, 
But uh, it's quite tragic, to be honest, that uh, all of those crises uh, affected most uh, the same group of sovereign countries. It's a, it's a tragic thing. Of course, it is accidental. Maybe we could find some reasons to link those, especially consequences. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, it is, it is a tragic uh, fact and very important uh, political fact for Europe, which uh, um, pose a question uh, about our ability to react as a union, uh, how to define the reaction which would be relevant to the situation we have right now. And of course, in the same time, we are still in, in, in preparatory phase of the conference uh, for the future of Europe. The conference was proposed before COVID, of course, but uh, I think uh, after COVID and with COVID experience and all that is related to this epidemiological experience, the conference on the future is even more relevant than, than before. Of course, before we will offer uh, wise advice for our own future, before we will conclude our opinions about what Europe uh, should look like, uh, I think we should very carefully uh, learn the lessons. And we know that uh, many different capitals or many different societies and nations learn uh, slightly different lessons from the previous crisis. Uh, but we have to continue our dialogue to understand uh, best the, the situation we have right now. So before we will offer any vision of the future, whatever vision it will be, we have to carefully study the situation we have right now in terms of political responsibility, economic consequences, and, and so on. The COVID situation, I think, uh, pose at least two different questions to the EU. First is strictly, uh, I would say narrow, but uh, we know that it is dramatic uh, in the same time, but strict medical and epi epidemiological questions where the um, responsibility of member states will, will stay in the same place maybe we can strengthen the coordination of our uh, efforts uh, that's for sure would be valuable uh, but i don't expect that in terms of uh, uh, health policy strictly defined health policy or even more public order or um, public security uh, the responsibility will not be uh, shared with any supranational uh, level. And probably rightly so, because uh, the decisions like uh, the decision of this year, like the complete lockdown, un unprecedented lockdown of shops, uh, services, uh, whole society and economy, and economy, this is the experience we have in almost every single European country, this sort of decisions should be uh, legitimate. Uh, and the legitimacy of those uh, decisions wouldn't be better with the, with the Brussels responsibility uh, at the first line. Coordination is good, but the decisions, especially the, the fact is that uh, the different member states had quite a different situation in, in different times. So I think we should be uh, rational here. But in the same time, uh, we have much wider spectrum of responsibility. Uh, which is a question of economic consequences of the, of the lockdowns, of the epidemiological situation in Europe. And here, European Union is uh, and, uh, and should be uh, um, a, a principal player, because this is about economic uh, governance, it's about transfer, as we know uh, today, and here it's hard to find any better solution like the European solution of the, for this, uh, this sort of situation. Of course, uh, I, um, I think we shouldn't believe that this uh, pandemic is the last one. So we should be resilient, we should be prepared for the next, because according to scientific research and scientific uh, um, findings, uh, we, we have to be prepared for the next, this sort of situation. For, for, for the moment, it's rather unusual, unprecedented for sure, but it is probably not the last time. So it's, it's a high time to learn, it's a high time to, to find uh, and select the best instruments we should have in, on, in our hands. In terms of um, public order, I already said, I don't expect that Europe will play a more important role in questions like 
like public order on the ground. But uh, we shouldn't reduce the situation only to this sort of thing. Uh, there are much more important uh, questions, especially now we see it very clearly. Uh, we have a lot of uh, much more important questions coming uh, from the um, economic uh, part of the, of the whole uh, situation. Uh, first of all, uh, it's of course our dependence on uh, international trade of pharmaceuticals and medical equipment. Of course, we advocate international trade. Globalization made a lot of good things also for our country. But in situations like this, I think it is wise to think twice on our uh, level of dependence in pharmaceuticals and medical equipment. That, this is why Poland, together with uh, other European countries, uh, uh, Germany, uh, France, uh, Denmark, uh, Belgium and Spain signed a letter to the European Commission to carefully analyze the situation of our uh, dependency on uh, medical equipment and, and pharmaceuticals. The other question, a little bit wider, I would say, I would I tried to collect my remarks this way, from the most strict to most general. A little bit wider question is the, the response to, uh, to economic crisis uh, um, correlated directly with the lockdown of the economy and, and society. And here, in general, we appreciate the European Commission's uh, proposal to do something unusual, I would agree, and to offer uh, extraordinary instruments to rescue uh, the, the European economy. For some, it is huge. It is very generous, for sure. Uh, for some, uh, 750 billion uh, on top of normal MFF is something even unacceptable, probably, according to the tone we hear in some capitals. From our perspective, it is a, a minimum uh, of relevant answer to the situation we have. Only during the next two years, we, a European economy, uh, will experience a, an investment gap, uh, according to the European Commission, up to one and a half trillion euros. This is the scale of the problem we are facing. So our answer should be relevant in terms of scale, should be relevant in terms of time, because in this specific situation, time is definitely money. The longer we are waiting with the response, the, the bill is higher, the, we pay more. Uh, and of course, uh, um, we have to put um, attention to grants. Uh, of course, loans are important. We, we already agreed to, um, to, to define new instruments like SURE on unemployment based on loans, uh, like the special lines in European Investment Bank and European uh, Stabilization Mechanism. It is very, very valuable efforts adopted by the ECOFIN ministers, I, I hope effectively implemented soon. But the loans are, are, are good for, for liquidity question. But uh, in case of member states where the problem of debt is already uh, too high, uh, offering loans is, uh, isn't relevant, is, is not enough. We need grants. Only grants can really help add a value to European response to the, uh, to the crisis. Of course, everything will be based on borrowing capacity of the Union which is right choice, this is the, the, the real European uh, uh, answer. I don't want to go into details because we have a lot of issues to be discussed and negotiated, of course, allocation schemes, the way we implement conditionalities, uh, structural reform, etc. We have to define it. But I wanted to stress that uh, in principle, the general approach of the European Commission uh, in terms of scale, in terms of timing, uh, in terms of, of proportion between grants and loans is, is the right approach to the situation uh, we have. Of course, we agree that we, we shouldn't create a precedent for the future. Uh, we should uh, be very firm on uh, exceptional nature of the, um, of the mechanism we are, we are talking about right uh, now. I, we agree, we, we share the opinion that we should be careful with this, not only because of the legalistic interpretation of the treaties, it, which is important, of course, but because we, we, we shouldn't uh, provoke even more anti-European sentiments in some member states where the problem of debt and sharing debt is, 
is, uh, is a question, is a, is a big political issue. So we should be clear on this. We should be clear on, on, on um, duration of the program. We should be clear on the repayment scenario. We should be clear on criteria, etc. That's for sure. But we need this sort of, of reaction uh, apart uh, from the MF, uh, MFA. Of course, we hear in the same time, we hear a lot of debts about the national contribution to the European uh, budget. This is not the first time. Every time we, we sit to talk about MFF, we hear that the contributions are too high, especially from, from some countries, uh, where the net position is, uh, is negative. I think it is very short-sighted. I think it's a, it's a budgetary populism uh, having in mind that the real benefits coming from the European integration is much, much higher. Uh, average seven times higher than the national contribution. The, in, the, the trade integration, um, uh, all benefits coming from the, from the single market uh, are much, much higher for every single country, not only for those who, uh, like Poland, uh, are beneficial also in terms of, uh, of direct transfer. Direct transfers are, are not the essence of European economic uh, cooperation. Uh, the essence is the single market and, uh, and the frugals should remember about it also in terms of public communication with their own societies because the one, one day uh, your society will uh, start to believe that net position is everything about union. This is the day when you, may, when you are making a step toward another exit. This is a British experience, exactly misleading interpretation of the of the budgetary obligations. But we understand the, the that. That's why we as Poland propose to be ambitious on new genuine own uh, resources. Uh, we believe that union should be or could be based much more than on national contributions on, uh, on genuine own resources like the financial transaction tax or digital tax, uh, single market levy, our carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism as proposed last month. I think we should be much more ambitious, and this is my advice to the European Commission, to be ambitious in preparation of the strict model of the own resources. What we can't accept in own resources debate is the, the model which would create situation where poorer economies, like Central European, but not only, would pay uh, proportionally more than the richest countries in the EU. Uh, the very good example is, of course, ETS-based own resources, uh, quite developed. We are happy to see that on the list of the last list of the European Commission, uh, we have much more than this proposition, and I think we should be serious about it. Also, to reduce the, the national contributions, so much controversial for some uh, for some countries. Uh, but uh, redistribution and uh, financial aspect are not the only uh, tools we have in our hands as a European Union to make our resilience um, stronger. I would like to mention just two uh, profound importance uh, for the crisis and, and generally for the, uh, for the future economic uh, welfare of the, of the Union. First of all is of course single market. Single market isn't finished yet. Uh, we have enormous delay in uh, preparation of the full integration of the service market. Uh, it's a pity because this is the only corner among the four, the only corner which is not uh, finished and not developed enough. Uh, we should tap this uh, potential uh, for our own uh, good. Uh, it's a potential for, for everyone. And of course, we should do more on digital market because here uh, the integration of the regulatory regime could create a, an added value for, for everyone. The other thing, which is um, very important from our perspective now, especially post-COVID, uh, is uh, state aid uh, and competition law. Uh, was, we fully accept, we understand the enormous need to put an unprecedented sum of money to economies of member states. This is a need we, we share, we do it. We have one of the highest proportion of the, of the transfer to economy to save them, to save labor markets, to, to save jobs, uh, to, to save sustainability of, of, of our society, to, to combat crisis in the, in the end. But we should be careful about the state 
aid uh, dumping. As we see the, the, the proportions right now, uh, it is um, a warning because the level of uh, state aid in the member states is, uh, is different. Um, half of them going to one country, uh, so the, of course the capacities are quite different. Uh, and I've, I think European Commission is fully aware about this problem, but we want to continue this, this debate. Maybe the recovery and resilience instruments could be a kind of compensation uh, for the countries which are not in a position to offer such an enormous money to, to economy to find a level playing field in terms of state uh, aid. Of course, when we are talking about the future, we shouldn't concentrate only um, on, on problems we have right now. The future of Europe depends, on, I think, on, on some other aspect. I just wanted to, to flag it uh, uh, point by point. I believe that this new European consensus, we need this Euro European consensus because we experience a lot of toxic, sometimes uh, stressful uh, situations. And so we need uh, a brighter uh, horizon. And this new European consensus could be based on, of course, recovery and resilience instruments together with the MFF based on investment policies like cohesion, but also equally important role of the common agricultural uh, policy, which is not only about sustainability of the, of the farmers and the society, it is also about our food security, it is also about climate change. So we stress the importance of those two treaty-based policies in the MFF uh, negotiation. The other, the second one, uh, is of course migration and asylum. We should close this um, long-term debate and sometimes toxic to be honest. Uh, we should concentrate on initiatives which can unite us. I think we already did a lot in common efforts to, uh, to, uh, to secure our borders, especially in, in those parts where the Resilience is lower, not because of the member states' failures, but because of the geography. I mean, and maritime borders, which are much more complicated to defend than, than the others. Poland is a country which defends uh, and secure the, the European border, external border, the longest after Finland. It's pretty aware how important it is, but we want to, to base this, this, this effort generally on external um, aspects of the migration. It is not only about borders, of course, I don't want to go into the details, not to consume all of your time about it, um, but without any coercion in, in relocation, because here we see clearly that the experience of member states, migratory uh, experience of member states is different, and we, you, you can't find a one scenario which would fit uh, all member states because of the historical, say, social, very deep, in fact, um, a deeply rooted um, um, profile, let's say. The, the third thing uh, uh, among the new European consensus uh, four pillars would be, of course, climate, uh, where we need uh, a compromise, which would be ambitious. We have no doubt that we should be ambitious about climate transformation, but at the same time, we have to recognize different starting points. And we have to recognize that the burden uh, should be shared in a, in a way which would be called fair and, and just. We did a lot. We made the steps toward the, the situation where the compromise could be agreed, but, but we are not still there. Uh, we, are, we are close. And of course, uh, last but not least, ambitious single market, which is uh, sometimes uh, somehow, at least in narrative, uh, some, somehow ad abandoned. Uh, treat, uh, treat it as something granted. Of course it is granted, it is a backbone of integration, but it doesn't mean that this is less important. I think this is one of the most important aspects of, of, of European integration. It, it gives us uh, a lot and it could give us even more. That's why we should be ambitious on, on the single market. In the end, such a new European consensus, I believe, could create a situation where uh, Europe, uh, would uh, deliver again. Uh, European output legitimization would be indisputable again. And then we would come back to the situation we all probably remember very well, early 2000, where the European optimism was something obvious in every single capital. This mood changed uh, a lot. Uh, and it's a, it's a great pity 
uh, we, we are, we are uh, troubled by this, uh, by this picture where we see a lot of complaints about Europe and different complaints in the north, different, different complaints in the south, and uh, probably uh, the, the, the shortest list of complaints in the Central Europe, sometimes against the perceptions, sometimes against the um, um, conventional truths. Uh, but anyway, the, the list of complaints is a little bit too long. We should reduce the list of complaints and the new European consensus based on, on four pillars I mentioned would be probably helpful. So we should uh, have it in mind, talking about future of Europe in these days. Thank you. And excuse me for a little bit longer, probably, um, uh, introduction. Uh, not at all, Minister. Thank you very, very much for such uh, comprehensive remarks. And may I also say very wise remarks on, on so many of the topics. May I, as uh, Chair, I take the liberty of uh, following up one area first, since you are the, the Minister for European Affairs. What's your current perception of this uh, Future of Europe conference, the state of preparation. It does seem that the European Parliament is, is forging ahead, perhaps somewhat <laughs> more rapidly than the Council. What's your expectation currently in relation to both the process of uh, actually starting it, but also as to the, uh, the subject matter? I think the conference on the future of Europe was planned as an enormous social consultation across the continent. Uh, it was before COVID, of course, so it was very easy and maybe even natural to say that we need such a direct, massive experience of, uh, of talking about Europe uh, in our uh, local communities, uh, not only capitals, and not only with professionals, but also with the people who are part of this project from the social point of view. After COVID, situation is a little bit different uh, because it's hard to imagine a real, direct social interaction as it was planned at the beginning. And probably the difference between Parliament and the Council is the fact that all governments at the moment are totally consumed with the direct COVID or post-COVID situations or challenges. They are different. Mm -hmm. uh, the situation isn't clear enough to, to say that, yes, now we can change the agenda and go back to the metapolitical uh, deliberations about about Europe. I think this is this is the difference. I, I see it in our Council of Ministers that uh, it's hard to uh, catch the attention of uh, something which is not related to this situation on the ground. We study the information, we try to react uh, in a relevant, most relevant way, and I think this is uh, this is a problem. And from my perspective, of course, I'm closer to this uh, sort of experience, like conference, the real conference. But I fully understand that we should uh, carefully understand the, the experience after COVID before we will go to conclusions. Because this experience is different in different capitals uh, and uh, isn't still fully understood what we really need as a union. So that's why I think we, we don't need to be in a hurry. Uh, but we should remember that we should draw, draw conclusions for our future, to be more resilient, well prepared, etc. Thank you. The first question I have is from uh, one of the researchers at the IIEA, as follows, Darren Mariotti. The incoming German presidency has prioritized the issue of rule of law and protecting European values. How does the Polish government hope to engage with Germany on this issue in the coming six months? No, we uh, already engaged uh, on these issues for a couple of years, so it is nothing new. Uh, also with Germany, because uh, Germany as our neighbor, of course, we are in still contact in many issues, including, including this. Um, it's, it's a huge issue, of course, but I would like to stress a couple of, of major things. First of all, uh, this is not a controversy about the principle of rule of law. The principle of rule of law is equally important for Warsaw, like for Berlin or, or Brussels. This is the principle of our constitution. No doubt that the, the rule of law principle is governing principle of our political uh, life. This controversy uh, is about implementation of this principle in the real ground situation, in this case, in specifically in case of uh, judiciary reform uh, in Poland. I mean, ju judiciary reform is debated in many countries, uh, probably including Ireland, before the new government will 
uh, a hold uh, a new term. Uh, so it is nothing unusual. Uh, I see the risk of double standards in, in European Commission's uh, practice. I would like to stress the risk, at least the risk of double standards, because I see that sometimes European Commission is trying to criticize the legal institutions uh, which uh, were in place um, during the time of our accession and was prized by the accession teams and uh, for many many years of our membership in the eu we want to restore the same institutions from the the, the time so it is unusual to see that uh, exactly the same institutions are now are criticized uh, it's uh, it's for example it's about the organization of the ordinary courts i don't want to go into details but this is a good example uh, another uh, risk of double standard is, of course, uh, a critical approach of European Commission to institutions which are well known in other countries. The example, a classic example, is a National Council, Council of Judiciary, uh, which is very, very similar in Poland, like in uh, Spain. Uh, and uh, in the second, the latter uh, example didn't create any, any objection or any controversy. So we see that risk, but in the end, we believe that the legal uh, disputes should be solved by courts, not by political bodies. And so what we expect from the whole machinery on values and rule of law at the European level is um, legal certainty. By the way, the legal certainty is a very important aspect, dimension of the rule of law itself. So when we see the proposals, which uh, are not um, very clear in terms of legal certainty and legal consequences, we are a little bit critical. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, Poland uh, um, implemented all the judgments of the court, of the European Court of Justice. Uh, it is important uh, to remember, and I think this is the way how to solve the problem, of course, within the limit of, uh, of conferred uh, competences. We know that the conferral, the principle of conferral, sometimes trigger um, quite hot debates at the European level. And, and I think this is the case where the problem of, of conferred um, and competences is, is quite valid. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I have a question from someone you may know, uh, Adrian Palm, who is now the Dutch ambassador in, in Ireland. Um, Good the master covers uh, the same, similar ground in, in his, the first part of his question. I would like to ask you about two elements, only slightly touched upon in your, in, in your minister's introduction. The rule of law. What has the EU-Poland dialogue since December, 15, uh, December 2015 brought to the Polish citizens? Second part of his question, sustainability. How can we ensure that greening the economy is not seen as a threat, but as an option for economic development? On the rule of law, I think I, I, I have nothing to add. I, I try to explain our position uh, also to de-dramatize this, this situation because of course this situation is unusual, I, I would agree, but, but we continue this, uh, this quite hard dialogue in a way which is sometimes helpful in the end. So I don't want to add anything on, on rule of law. On sustainability, uh, I touched the issue of the um, climate uh, transformation. Uh, we are stick to the transformation also of the Polish economy when you see the data about the energy mix, a uh, growing potential of uh, photovoltaic, for example, uh, doubled this year, uh, comparing with the predictions. Um, offshore wind uh, on Baltic Sea, this is a huge potential and, and also business case, which is important. It is not just a regulatory action of the state, it is also a business case behind, which is very, very promising. But in the same time, we have to remember that the starting point, to be general, the starting point of the Polish economy, inherited from the communist time, uh, is, uh, is, is, is different than, than, for example, Dutch. Uh, that's uh, why we are uh, in a position to agree that the Europe should be climate neutral in 2050. We agreed uh, in December to this, but with a clear reference that Poland isn't obliged to do it in the same pace, in the same um, way. It doesn't mean that we don't want to transform our economy, just opposite. We, we do want 
transform our economy, but the scenario of, of transformation should be based on our economic and social realities. For example, the risk of energy poverty in Poland is probably one of the highest in the EU. So we, we did a lot with the social transfers last four or five years to, um, to make our society much more sustainable and more resilient to the, to the question of the, of the poverty in general, not only energy poverty, but we have to be very careful. So, so this is why we continue dialogue with the European Commission and the, and the member states about the European uh, just transition fund. Uh, I think this is the right way to do it, to find um, a mechanism which would uh, support uh, the best possible projects which offer the, the highest reduction of CO2. And I think the projects proposed by Polish regions, um, by Polish companies, uh, by Poland in the end, will offer a chance to reduce the, the emissions in a way which would be very significant in whole um, European contribution to the global Paris Agreement uh, obligations. I, I'm pretty sure we know the data, for example, the heating sector, most, most developed heating sector probably in Europe, um, uh, has an enormous potential to, to transit into much more uh, sustainable uh, um, shape or profile, but we need a realistic scenario. And in this realistic scenario, for example, in, in this case, gas should play a much more important role. And when we, we understand some countries where the gas isn't necessary. I think Netherlands isn't a good example, but for many countries, uh, transit uh, energy uh, fuel isn't very important. In our case, the transit energy uh, fuel um, is, is very important. And this is, this is gas. Uh, when we find such a evolutionary scenario, I think we will find a common ground on future of climate, European climate policy. Yeah. Indeed, uh, climate very much on the, the minds of uh, many people, including um, a researcher here at the um, IIEA, Killian Rossi asks, if you could expand on your uh, government's opposition to using revenues from the ETS to fund the post-COVID-19 recovery. I think you've covered much of that, but if there is any further detail you wish to offer in, in, in relation to that aspect of own resources. No, the, the way uh, European Commission proposed uh, how to form uh, a revenue for the European budget based on revenues from the ETS is, is regressive in essence, because it would create a situation where we proportionally would pay much more than the richest countries in, in the EU. So it is not very fair. It is not just, and it is impossible to defend this sort of obligation, the financial obligation of, of country in any parliament. Uh, we don't want to be just negative. That's why we propose other forms of own uh, resources. Uh, I mentioned financial, digital, single market, uh, carbon. Um, but uh, the ETS uh, itself uh, was planned as a, an instrument to help uh, in a transition. So we, we, we can't uh, forget about it that uh, we got some portions uh, of, of ETS allowances to use it different ways. So, so this is why mm -hmm. the regressive nature of, the, of, the, of this uh, own resources is, is a problem. Okay. Um, just turning to the, the external side, I'm, I'm conscious that you are a minister from the country at the easternmost uh, frontier of the Union, speaking to us in the, the westernmost part of the Union. I have a question here from the ambassador of Georgia in this country, uh, George uh, Zurabashvili. Poland, as an initiator of the Eastern Partnership, how would you evaluate the ongoing progress, how successfully it's developing? And how do you see the future of the partnership? I think that uh, our heads of state and government actually had an interaction on this just, uh, just a few days ago. Since the time of uh, um, foundation of the Eastern uh, Partnership, I think many things happened, uh, positive things happened on the European side. The reaction of Russia to the pro-Western integration of some countries is uh, a contrary uh, a best argument that we did the right thing. Uh, we want to open the door, uh, it doesn't mean membership uh, at the moment, but we want to uh, create a union which would be able to 
take responsibility for our neighborhood. We have different uh, challenges on the eastern side, quite different on the southern side. Everything changed because I remember the 2004 5 where we formed the European neighborhood policy. We believed that our neighborhood will be uh, more and more uh, converged or more and more stable because the European model will be so much attractive that everyone will, will, will join that, that model. And probably it could happen, but because uh, um, of many factors, uh, it, it didn't happen. Uh, it, it happened quite successful in Georgia and in Ukraine with enormous price, to be, to be honest. The, the price the, the Ukrainians and Georgians pay for the pro-Western uh, aspirations is, uh, is something unknown for average European, I would say. And I think it should be taken into account as well, especially in times when uh, Europeans here in the Union are so reluctant to say that EU is something good. Um, so we want to develop this, this project. We, we believe that we should keep this promise, keep this um, responsibility, uh, not only in, uh, in the interest of the countries of the Eastern um, Partnership, but also in our own interest. Uh, there is no um, space uh, for vacuum, for political vacuum around our borders. We know it very well now, sometimes with quite tragic examples. So if uh, Europe uh, will be not uh, able uh, to take responsibility in cooperation and in, in openness, um, not in force, um, uh, someone else will do it. So, so the, a kind of a strategic competition is something historically uh, um, rooted in, in this part of the world. It's, it's different in, in the South, of course, and the Northern Africa, probably someone else should uh, make remarks about it. It's, it's different, uh, um, but uh, in nature is more or less the same. If Europe is not able to, to do it, someone else will do it at the expense of our security, and at the expense of our welfare in the end, because the trade integration of the region would be um, attractive uh, for European Union. May I ask you myself, as, as a follow-up, how you see then the, the evolution of the EU's relations with Russia over the, you know, over the coming period? Um, I, just to recall that only last week the sanctions on Russia in relation to the Ukraine have been renewed in a part of a rolling process of, uh, of renewal. They, and, and recent report as well in relation to um, some of the uh, the um, online digital manipulation, fake news, and so on has not been very um, not been very helpful to creating a, a trustful atmosphere between east and west. There, so how do you see it more generally over the next period? That that category of relations. Having in mind what Europe offered the Russian Federation at the beginning. Um, it is very negative uh, development because we, as a union, that time Poland, it was first years of Poland membership in the union, so we were not very uh, uh, great believers, but, uh, but we agreed that we should offer something positive uh, to Russian Federation to form a pragmatic uh, form of, uh, of relations with this great country, uh, to accept that, uh, that we are somehow neighbors, uh, um, with enormous potential and, and that we can form these pragmatic relations and develop pragmatic relations in many, many senses. But the offer was refused. It's pretty clear. Russia, since that time, decided to be aggressive, uh, uh, first of all, against the, the countries of uh, eastern flank of neighborhood, but also for so, uh, against some European countries. I, mm -hmm. I, I want to, to remind the, the problems with Estonia, with Latvia, now we have a problem even with the countries uh, of, um, of Western Europe and the interventions, to put it mildly, uh, against the democratic system of, uh, of, our, of our states, of our, our countries, uh, isn't uh, an argument uh, in favor of any relaxation of the sanction regime. This is just minimum, and I'm afraid we have no choice but to wait for Russian Federation to change uh, its mind uh, on uh, on its presence in this part of the world, mm -hmm. which could take some time. <laughs> it already took some time. Um, yeah, but we have so to be patient. Back, 
sorry, turning back to another topic that, that concerns both our countries in, in different ways. Brexit uh, concerns us, of course, but it concerns you. Um, in a, in, I know it's quite a, um, a well-followed topic in, um, in Poland. A former colleague of mine, uh, Donald Denham, a former ambassador in the service, asks, with the withdrawal of the UK from the EU, Poland is now among the top five in terms of population in the EU. <clears throat> is Poland interested in taking on a more forceful leadership role within the EU to balance Franco-German dominance up to now? Um, I don't believe uh, in, uh, in such a modeling of the situation. The, the Franco-German alliance is very important uh, uh, with its historical importance to the to the foundations of the European integration, uh, no doubt, and, and history plays a role. It is uh, not that uh, as it was as, as 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 it was predicted that history will not play a role. So, the significance of this alliance is of course important, but uh, um, it is it is pretty clear, and I, I believe that also in Berlin and Paris that it's impossible to project the European future only by two capitals. And of course, those two capitals are not in line, fully in line in, in many, many issues. Uh, we saw it very clearly um, just after the debt crisis, where the two capitals took quite different perspective on what should happen with, uh, with the Eurozone debt um, instability and lack of convergence of, of the macroeconomics of the, of the Eurozone member states. So, uh, I, I don't want to, to create such a, such a picture where we have to consolidate against the, mm -hmm. the Franco-German alliance. We, we need uh, cooperation in, in Europe, uh, not uh, tensions. Of course, uh, the withdrawal of the UK, it changes a lot uh, and of course changes for worse. From the European perspective, from the Polish mm -hmm. perspective, it is not, I don't see any, anything good in, in this. I understand that the Brit for British people, for, Many of them, it's the right choice. It is, it is obvious. Uh, it, it is it's a sovereign decision, but I don't see any anything positive coming uh, from this fact uh, for Union or for Poland for for anybody else. We are losing very important country, of course, part of the European balance in many many senses. For example, in regulatory uh, policy, uh, so we. Um, we are concerned about the, the possible lack of balance. In the same time, we are losing balance in transatlantic relations. Uh, so, um, lack of UK will be troublesome for, for sure. That's why we are so dedicated to find any any other form of uh, of cooperation. It's a great pity that that we that we can't find that form of cooperation because we you need two for this sort of tango. I hope uh, we will recreate this uh, ambitious cooperation in the nearest future uh, but uh, but at the moment it doesn't look um, it doesn't look good mm. it's true that uh, from the intra eu perspective uh, the balance of power proposed by the lisbon treaty uh, this this mechanism of, mm -hmm. of redistribution of power proposed by the lisbon treaty was planned for the union which expands uh, not the union uh, which uh, is losing uh, any country, especially such a big country like UK. So it is an issue, of course. Uh, we, we have to be careful. That's why we invite member states to build consensus in place of QMV wherever possible. Uh, but it's, it's a political question, uh, yeah. quite different. Okay, just as a subsidiary question, could I ask you about the processes now of uh, the V4 co-op of the Visegrad uh, countries? What, what, uh, what are the, the greatest commonalities of interest and how intensive is the process of cooperation on, on uh, EU matters? Of course, in the EU, you can't find two uh, exactly the same countries. Mm. Uh, that's a great value of, of EU. It, it is uh, determined by history, scale, experience, uh, political sensitivity, political philosophy, even for, for probably those who are much more familiar with the, um, with the humanities would add a lot to understand better, uh, quite contemporary, everyday uh, um, politics. But in the same time, before I can say it's one of the, of the best organized group uh, around interest, around common uh, aspirations. Uh, of course, sometimes uh, we have to say no, like in case of migra 
some aspects of migration. But usually we are suggesting, we are proposing positive uh, scenarios. Uh, and single market is one of the uh, questions where we uh, can contribute. Uh, the MFF debate, I think we offered a lot of positive uh, solutions. I already mentioned ma many, many of them. We just adopted the common position in, in Brno, in beautiful castle of Lednice, the, the common position before the negotiations of the, uh, of the MFF and recovery. So it's nice, very, very friendly cooperation coming from mm -hmm. quite pragmatic roots. But uh, in the same time, no one of those countries uh, would like to reduce the European activity just to be four. We, we know that the EU is the richness of 27 and it, this form of cooperation isn't against anybody. It, yeah. It's just the form to strengthen the, the message. Indeed. Uh, turning back to, to the external side, uh, I have a question from Porik Murphy, a member of the Institute, a former uh, ambassador in our service. The current US administration has made no secret of its hostility to the European project. How do you see the role of the United States in Europe? Uh, it's a pity to hear some of the comments made uh, by uh, politicians on both sides about the future of uh, Euro-American cooperation because um, our problems in security, in welfare, trade situation, position in the world are mostly common and uh, we shouldn't reduce the, the common agenda for the world. Uh, so we hear it with, uh, with concern. Uh, we believe uh, that, especially now, uh, comments and narrative is sometimes not fully representative to the essence and substance. Uh, I think there are many proofs that uh, the reality looks, looks better. But um, we don't want to be blind to the fact that the unity or the transatlantic unity is in crisis. Um, what, diverge us from, from some countries is, uh, is the fact that we want to, uh, to do um, something to, to make it better because we are not satisfied with the fact that uh, the transatlantic ties are not so strong as it should be. So we want to show that this glass is uh, half full, not only half empty. And of course we expect, we hope that the mutual understanding will be better. Good. If I could just turn back myself to um, uh, an internal policy, if you like, what is the position generally with regard to the Polish economy, but more particularly with regard to Poland and the common currency, the euro? What is the current state of play in relation to uh, possible membership? I think our approach to a monetary integration as a country, but also as a society, is quite uh, pragmatic because uh, I've been surprised, to be honest, by the fact that uh, after the debt crisis, uh, but uh, much later, not uh, during the most dramatic uh, moments of this crisis, where news were full of, of, of quite um, toxic um, content, um, we, we noticed something very interesting that uh, polls are definitely determined to, to support European integration as a whole. Um, in spite of uh, some bad moments or a bad narrative, in spite of uh, some uh, tensions, there was no doubt that uh, for, for Poles as a society, as a nation, European Union is something absolutely obvious. Mm -hmm. But in case of Euro, Eurozone monetary integration, the situation is different. And when you see the polls, uh, it is not just political choice. That, that's what I want to say. It's not just a political choice of one or another party. I think it is, uh, it is a national experience that the, the future of Eurozone isn't very clear and isn't very known. Uh, and that's why we are much more hesitant about the monetary integration. Uh, and I think the crisis in 2008 was 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 important the experience. I think Poles um, uh, followed the, the discussion inside the eurozone, and at the moment we are pretty sure that, uh, in spite of enormous progress made, uh, we still have uh, a list of questions, uh, especially about transfers and shared uh, debt, uh, which are not uh, uh, solved inside this this union. So before this, the, the the problems like this will be solved. 
I don't expect that the polls will be massively in favor of the Eurozone. It doesn't mean that we don't want to follow um, a responsible uh, fiscal policy. We, we don't want to keep um, a monetary sovereignty to do with our currency whatever we, we like. No, we, we, we are very prudent and we, we are very uh, fiscally responsible country and we will hold that line, but it doesn't mean that we will easily join the, the Eurozone before the problems will be, uh, will be solved. Minister, I think we can uh, wrap it there. I don't have at this point any further questions, but I would like to thank you very much on my own behalf and that of all of the participants. Uh, you've left us with a much deeper and uh, more profound grasp of your own country's um, preoccupations uh, in the post-COVID European uh, sphere, but also you've given us great insights into the debates that are currently going on within the uh, within the EU um, 2027, 20, as, as we practically are now. So I can only uh, wish you well in these very difficult negotiations that you have described as upcoming. And I very much hope that we'll be able to welcome you in person uh, to the IIEA at a future date and uh, uh, perhaps to update us on how these negotiations and uh, the European project have indeed turned out in this uh, most unusual period that we're traversing. Thank you very much, Minister. Yes, thank you. I, I will be very happy to, to join you one day in, in Dublin because of many, many reasons, but also because of the reputation of your, uh, your institute. A kind uh, introductory remark is something, uh, um, is, a, is a question of culture, I, I have no doubt, but the kind uh, final remarks is something even more valuable. Thank you very much <laughs> for your kind words. Thank you all the audience. Uh, uh, I hope it was interesting and, and hopefully to see you one day. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.